Welcome everyone. Good evening. This is our COVID-19 Conversations Best Safety Practices panel. Um, we are going to give it just a few minutes for more attendees to join us. Um, but tell us in the chat where you're joining us from. Uh, maybe tell us why you tuned in tonight. Um, I know we're all quite fatigued of the pandemic, um, but you're here for a reason. So tell us why you're here, where you're from. I'm located in Atlanta, Georgia. NSHSS is headquartered here. My name's Grace Dent. I'm the manager of partnerships and events. Um, I know Dr. Modadel is joining us from San Diego and Tyler's joining us um, from Rush University. I'm not exactly sure where that is, Tyler, so if you could share with us where you're joining us from. Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, awesome. Yeah. Very different climates, uh, Chicago and California. Yes. It's yeah. quite cold here in Atlanta. I don't know, I'm sure it's colder in Chicago. Yeah, we're like 30s here right now, so. Ooh, <laughs> ouch. Yeah. Yeah, guys, tell us in the chat where you're joining us from. Feel free to chat with each other in that window. We've got Oregon. Our co-founder, Klaus Nobel, lives in Oregon. Very cool. West Virginia. Very nice. We'll give it just a few more minutes here, guys. 36 degrees in Brooklyn. That's really cold. I hope you guys are staying safe wherever you are. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is a very important topic, as you know, um, as we enter what will hopefully be the last months of this pandemic. Um, we wanted to give you guys a quick refresher course because it is just as important as ever to stay safe, even though we're all expecting a vaccine in the next few months, hopefully. Um, we have two health professionals here who have been in the midst of the pandemic. So they are here to talk to you guys about safety and what it means to um, continue to be an empathetic person, um, caring for other people, making sure that you're being safe. We have a parent of an SHSS in the chat from New Jersey. Hello, hello. I hope your member is joining us as well. We love to have our, our students and their families on here. Um, from Los Angeles, California, I'm here because I want to be more informed about this. Awesome, we love that. Absolutely good to admit when you're not informed and attend things like this when you want to be informed. So with that, we have quite a few people in the room with us, so we can get started here. Again, my name is Grace Dent. I'm the manager of partnerships and events at MSHSS. I'm excited to be here with everyone tonight. Thank you to Dr. Modadel and Tyler for being here with us tonight. I know you work long hours being health professionals now, so we truly appreciate it. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Kelly Modadel. Kelly, if you could share a bit about yourself and why you're here tonight with us. Sure, thank you, Grace. Um, so thank you for having me this afternoon slash evening, depending on where you are in the world. And as Grace said, my name is Dr. Kelly Modadel. I'm the Child Health Officer for the County of San Diego. And as such, I'm basically the clinical con uh, consult for various children's programs throughout the county, things that we, uh, pertain to child welfare or development or behavioral health, um, among other medical services in the county. Prior to joining the county, I was the chief medical officer of a federally qualified health center called Vista Community Clinic. I was there for 15 years. And I did my pediatric training at University of California, San Francisco's Fresno program. And while I was there, received my master's of public health as well. I was born and raised here in San Diego County, although I have lived a few other places um, in the country. Uh, most of my time it's been spent here and I have two little ones of my own who are not yet adolescents, but hopefully will be as successful as many of you on, on the call today in the future. Thank you, Dr. Mutterdell. Thank you for being here with us. And Tyler, uh, thank you as well. Would you introduce yourself for us, please? Yes, hello everyone. And again, thank you uh, for having me as well tonight. Um, so my name is Tyler Weiss. I'm a, a respiratory therapist at Russian University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. Um, just as of two weeks, I just transitioned into the clinical education coordinator, um, but I've been working the front lines of this pandemic for um, since it started. So I am, as I'm sure you guys are, I'm getting sick and tired of this, uh, this pandemic, um, but looking to, uh, I'm happy to inform you guys more about stuff um, on this pandemic and how to stay safe. 
Um, some of the things that I have done recently um, with COVID, COVID has given some opportunities to my profession. It, uh, if anything positive has came out of this pandemic, it's put respiratory therapists a little bit on the map. We're usually a forgotten uh, uh, medical uh, profession, but we're always here. So um, through this, I've published several papers this year on COVID-19, one being on COVID-19 um, and prone positioning and in intubated patients. Um, as well as a patient on how to keep us healthcare professionals safe when, uh, when caring for COVID-19 patients. Um, so it's, it's provided some opportunities to, to add to the literature um, for me. Uh, but again, thank you for, uh, for having me here and I look forward to this talk. Yeah, Tyler, we appreciate you both. You're the experts in this field, absolutely. So we couldn't do this without you. So thank you for being here. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Modadel has some uh, key points for us that she'll walk us through, and then we will hear from Tyler, and then we will take your questions at the end, so please save those. We will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So at this point, I will go off camera, and Dr. Modadel, please take it away. Sounds great. Thank you, Grace. So there's obviously many aspects of safety when it comes to COVID-19, and I'm going to focus on just a few of them at this point, um, and that is that of routine care, return to sports, and mental health, because these are really the ones that impact adolescents most um, in particular. Before I get into those, I just want to provide a little bit of background. Um, so first, nationally, there are over, as of last week, there were over 1.3 million cases of COVID-19 in children, and that was with over 300,000 of them happening just in the two weeks prior. And since then, things have only gotten worse, and we anticipate them to continue to get worse over the next few weeks as we see the result of people's holiday gatherings, unfortunately, um, starting to trickle in as of this week. Thankfully, severe illness is, is relatively uncommon in children, and deaths account for only 0.1% or less of the COVID deaths in the U.S. So that's good news as far as how severe COVID-19 could be in, in adolescents. But there are definitely things that um, are impacting the safety of adolescents. Before I get into that, um, I just want to share that a recent Canadian study found that the most common symptoms in children are loss of taste and smell, fever, headache, and vomiting, and nausea. Um, however, one third of the kids that tested positive for COVID actually had no symptoms at all, one third. So that's quite a lot, and that's more um, asymptomatic cases in kids than we usually see in the adults. With the other symptoms that you're used to hearing about in the news, such as runny nose or cough and sore throat, in children, those that tested positive were just as likely to have those symptoms as those that tested negative. So that's not to say those symptoms can't represent COVID-19, but they often represent other viruses or other illnesses and not, are not as specific for COVID-19. But the loss of taste and smell, headache, fever, nausea and vomiting, those ones tend to be more specific for COVID. So next slide, please. So how do we stay safe? Uh, well, one of the greatest health risks um, for adolescents during the pandemic has been the decline in routine care. And that is particularly true around vaccines, but also well visits and some other things. From insurance data, we know that millions of children have missed routine vaccinations this year. And currently the US is on track to fall 9 million doses lower of vaccines given in 2020 than they had in 2019. So that's actually a 26% drop from last year and the number of vaccines being given. And with this, the US is at risk for widespread disease, particularly related to measles or whooping cough. Generally, children who fall behind in vaccinations are protected because those around them are vaccinated, but currently there are large groups of children and adolescents who are now behind. Highly contagious vaccine preventable diseases are circulating in other parts of the world and really are just a plane ride away as we've seen with COVID itself. So those vaccines that are most relevant to adolescents, and we want to make sure that you're current with, are the Tdap vaccine, which present, prevents against not just tetanus, but the whooping cough, the HPV or human papillomavirus vaccine, which prevents against cervical and oral cancers, among other cancers, meningococcal vaccines, there's actually two of them that you may need uh, to prevent against meningitis or an infection in the brain and spinal cord, and then influenza, which most of us know is the flu. So it is important just as every year it's important, but even more important this year to make sure you're up to date with your flu vaccine. Um, we wanna keep people out of the hospital for other reasons as much as possible, and kids do get quite sick um, from flu. So 
We want to make sure you're current with vaccines. The worst drop we saw from, was back in the spring, and things are starting. People are starting to get back into the um, physician offices for their vaccines now. But we are worried about another drop as the cases are starting to surge. So please don't let this be a reason to stay away from your physician's office, because also annual well visits are important, and many of those have been missed this year as well. What's checked for at a well visit? You might think, well, my, my, I'm not feeling any symptoms right now. That's not so important. Or my child seems healthy. I don't probably need to go in for their well child exam this year. I'll just skip just this one year. But really, you know, there's a lot that doctors are doing during that visit that not are always or even discussed. So we're screening for depression and anxiety in particular. We're looking at evaluation of high-risk behaviors so we can do proper education. We're screening for sexually transmitted disease. And the physical exam itself often can pick up things that didn't present as any symptomatic thing a parent or an adolescent would have recognized, but the clinician themselves might recognize as a problem that can be picked up early. And telehealth has been great through this pandemic. We're really glad that we have the technology to be able to do that, but it's not always sufficient. And so if your doctor recommends that you come into the office for a visit, for a well visit, or for any other reason, I really want to encourage you to heed his or her advice. Doctor's offices are generally well equipped at this point with COVID prevention policies, which is not, was not necessarily the case back in March and April. But now most have sufficient uh, personal protective equipment or PPE. They have proper cleaning supplies. They have other protections in place for their patients. But don't hesitate to ask your physician's office what they're doing to protect you before you come into a visit. But please know that most of them are ready to take care of any of your needs, and we don't want you to even miss those things that may be considered routine. Next slide, please. So depending on where you live, you may or may not be allowed to be participating in team sports again right now. In California, where I'm at, for example, drills and certain practice routines are allowed in some of the counties, uh, but competitive sports have been essentially shut down this whole time. Unfortunately, many, are, many um, kids and adolescents are participating in these unauthorized events, either within the state or traveling outside the state where another state might allow it. So if you are participating in sports activities, it's really critical that you follow the safety precautions. So risk can be decreased, but it's not eliminated when we use face masks, um, uh, follow the physical distancing, stay within specific cohorts or teams or sets of players, um, playing our sports outside whenever possible, minimizing travel, staying within your own county in particular, minimizing the sharing of equipment, and not sharing food or drink. So you know those orange peels that you used to get after practice or after a game, those should not be happening right now. And just last Friday, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually updated its guidance on face masks in particular, saying that really those should be worn during the sport, not just when you're on the sidelines or before or after the game, although that is important. Um, they felt like with very few exceptions, um, sports could be played with face masks on. So those exceptions would be things like swimming and diving for obvious reasons, gymnastics and cheerleading where things could get tangled up or wrestling. But outside of that, they, although it may seem kind of foreign or awkward at first, practicing and playing games with your face mask on, really you can grow accustomed to it. And there are some studies out there to show that oxygen levels are not impacted by wearing face masks, even when exerting yourself. So you, would, you should really consider wearing, keeping that face mask on the whole time. The sidelines, however, are particularly risky. People kind of let their guard down. They might be go going over to take their mask off to have a drink of water or to have something to eat. So really want to make sure that you're maintaining your physical distancing because that's where we often see transmission occurring. Testing is not recommended as a way to clear yourself to play a sport. So don't be lured into thinking, oh, I have a negative test so I can play the game this weekend. Really, you, you want to still maintain all those other factors that we're talking about for safety. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people, I've been hearing a lot of stories and seeing a lot of medical reports where people with symptoms or who actually have had a positive test have sort of kept it quiet because they really wanted to play in that game. And unfortunately, that has resulted in, in the transmission of disease. So if you have any COVID symptoms, any of them at all, even just one symptom, we really want to make sure that you get tested. Um, if you're tested positive or even if you're just symptomatic but haven't had a chance to get that test, we really want you to refrain from playing sports until you're well. 
Don't travel with your team um, you know, and say, well, I won't play, but I'm going to go along on that trip. Um, and really, we want you to stay home um, all together. And also, if you live with someone who is positive, you should be quarantining. So you should be staying home and, and staying away from the sports field um, in that scenario as well. Because remember, one third of adolescents and children are asymptomatic when they're infected. So you could be contagious even if you don't have symptoms. The other aspect of sports that's uh, relevant for your safety is when to return to sports after you've been ill. So if you've had severe disease, um, or if you've had a complication known as multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children, MISC, you need to be cleared by a physician, preferably a heart specialist or cardiologist, prior to returning to sports. The American Academy of Pediatrics has advised that children with severe disease or have had MISC actually refrain from sports for three to six months. And that's because of the risk of heart disease, even when cardiac testing is initially normal. We don't have a way to know who's going to develop cardiac disease at this point. And often those with mild uh, illness or even asymptomatic cases, those are the ones that go on to develop the MISC. So even if you've had mild illness or have been asymptomatic but tested positive, we still want you to refrain from sports for 14 days of no symptoms. And then also that you should work with your physician still to really be cleared before you return to sports. MISC typically doesn't present for two to four weeks after that initial infection. So really we wanna be careful and kind of return gradually. Um, you don't wanna just jump back into full practice and you wanna pay attention to any symptoms that you might be having. If you're having any chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, palpitations or dizziness, those could be signs of heart disease and you do not want to return to sports at that point or stop if you have returned and check in with your doctor. So again, return to sports is another thing that you should be in touch with your doctor about to best know when it is safe to return. And finally, as it pertains to sports, we wanna make sure people are staying active regardless of your athletic ability. So even if you're not in a sport, we want you to be active during this time. It's so hard when you're staying home all the time. We want you to get outdoors. We want you to do it safely. But that physical activity is a really important um, part of your health. Next slide. And one of the reasons that's important for your health is your mental health. So we know that physical activity really helps with mental health problems and uh, depression and anxiety have been at an all time high during the pandemic for adolescents. Now, in the US and elsewhere, these numbers have become quite alarming. So a couple of months ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics president, Sally, Dr. Sally Goza said, we know from research on the impact of natural disasters on the mental health of children that prolonged exposure to this kind of toxic stress is damaging. Um, she went on to say most natural disasters have an end, but at that time she made the statement this pandemic had gone on for over eight months and we knew it was likely to continue to disrupt our lives for many more and we are still two months from that and no, no near end in sight. So this is a long term um, toxic environment um, for mental health. And we are seeing the numbers of depression and anxiety on the rise. So pre-COVID, 10% of teens reported depression. Um, but since then, we found up to 33% of teens reporting uh, moderate to severe depression and 35% reporting moderate to severe anxiety. And these are by diagnostic criteria. So not just, oh, I'm feeling a little down, but actually would be diagnostic for moderate or severe disease. There was a report released by the CDC last month that showed from mid-March through October, the percent of mental health related emergency department visits for children aged 12 to 17 had increased approximately 31% relative to 2019. And actually the numbers were almost as bad for five to 11 year olds as well. This is something that every pediatrician with whom I've spoken pretty much has told me that they're all seeing higher numbers of patients with mental health concerns. But what may not have been known is that actually these numbers were on the rise even before the pandemic. So now you throw the pandemic on top of it and we see how bad things can, can get. What's most shocking about the ED visits is really ED visits as a whole have um, dropped over this time. The, a number of people coming into the ED have, has really dropped down. However, people did not stop coming in and actually came in more often for their mental health concerns. When I give this talk to other physicians, I really emphasize the need for universal screening for depression and anxiety amongst all kids, um, but especially those 12 and older. And this is something that we're seeing not just in the US. This is a worldwide problem. China had a couple of studies that showed that their rates of depression nearly doubled from 13% to 22%. 
and also that in their junior and senior high schools, a study done with 8,000 junior and senior high school students, they found the prevalence of depression to be at 43% and of anxiety at 37%. These juniors and seniors actually had 31% of them had symptoms of both depression and anxiety. And it's not just China and here, you can find studies from nearly every country from Bangladesh to Spain showing these increasing rates of depression, anxiety, behavior change sleep disruption or other emotional disorders. So even if you're feeling okay yourself, it's a good time to check in with your friends and your peers. Parents, it's a good time to be having sort of daily conversations of check in with your teens, even if you haven't noticed anything. We really wanna try and get to these kids before they end up in the emergency department. Next slide, please. So in summary, you know, the pandemic obviously has been hard on everyone, um, but there's lots of things we can do to stay safe. And so I really wanna encourage you, and I know um, Mr. Weiss is gonna talk more about some of these things as well in more detail, but we, we refer to them as the four W's here in San Diego. So wear a mask, walk away six feet, wash your hands and wait at home if you're sick. So if you're doing those things, you're doing your part to keep those around you safe as well as yourself. We know that the negative impact of the coronavirus for kids is not visible in the numbers of COVID cases, but is impacting them in many other ways with loss of routine care, inability to play sports, and the mental health concerns that I discuss, discuss but many other things as well. And we know that these negative effects can last well past the time of the pandemic as well. So keep up with your routine care, stay active, monitor your mental health and of those around you, ask for help, if you are experiencing problems, and hopefully as we get more data, we'll be able to give you even better advice um, in the future for staying safe. Grace, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Motodell. That's really great information and some things I think I haven't thought about yet, um, like the sports especially. So thank you so much for that. Um, I know, Mr. Weiss, you have some other points for us, so I will turn it over to you um, for your points. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Motodell. I agree, that was uh, very good. I'm an adult respiratory therapist, so I don't uh, necessarily think a lot about the, the kids in my everyday uh, practice, so a lot of great information there. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you about is something that you guys have probably heard a thousand times this year already. And these are just the tips to staying safe. And Dr. Motodell kind of uh, alluded to what I'm gonna talk about with the four W's, which I also like very much. It's the first time I heard that as well. Um, so, and, and this is basically, I'm just summarizing things from the CDC uh, that have recommend, uh, recommendations that they have given uh, in order to stay safe and control the spread of this, uh, of COVID-19. Next slide. Um, so first, I think it's important just to know how COVID-19 spreads. So we know that it spreads mainly from person to person. Um, that being said, we have found it is able to live on surfaces, um, but the main spread is from person to person. So people within close contact, that's why we tell you to social distance, you know, stay six feet away from each other. Um, and what happens is when someone is infected, um, they cough or they sneeze or even talk, they can spread those respiratory droplets and you can breathe them in and then you could potentially become uh, infected. Um, the most important thing, and again, Dr. Uh, Motodell talked about this a lot, uh, especially in the, I believe it was 31% of children uh, showed no symptoms, which that can be a very serious thing because they're not showing symptoms, they may think they're okay. And if, if you're not careful, you could be uh, spreading uh, COVID-19 to other, other people. So even though you don't show symptoms, you could potentially spread COVID-19. Um, so really the best way to prevent the illness is to avoid being exposed to the virus. So we do this by social distancing. Uh, if you feel sick or if someone in your household is sick, you quarantine, um, wear masks uh, when you're out outside, things like that. Um, to, to prevent the illness is just avoid being, being exposed to the virus. Easier said than done. Um, next slide. Um, so clean your hands and clean them often. Uh, when 
when you're out, out and about, if you're going to the grocery store, you think about all the things that the people at the grocery store have touched, that, that apple, that cereal box, uh, whatever it is, you know, that you're touching potential things. As I said, the virus may, uh, we do know, can live on surfaces. Um, and that's a place where you could potentially pick it up. Um, so wash your hands, wash them often. Um, if you don't have soap and water, uh, you can use a hand sanitizer. We, you would like to use uh, a san hand sanitizer that has 60% alcohol. Cover your whole hands, rub them together until dry. Um, otherwise, soap and water, wash them for 20 seconds, uh, and you should be good. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Again, these are all areas where um, the virus could enter your body. Um, social dis distancing. This has became like the um, the term of the year, I think, is social distance. Never heard of it really in my life until 2020. Um, so social distance, it's limit your contact with others as much as possible. And I know that this is a hard time of year to do this um, during the holidays where we all like to gather with family and friends and celebrate um, New Year's coming up, celebrating the new year. But this is a time where we need to all kind of buckle down and with the beauty of technology, we can do Zoom, Christmases, Thanksgivings, uh, what have you. Um, you should avoid close contact with individuals that are sick. This is, um, seems obvious. If someone feels sick, um, avoid contact with them. Um, and again, if that person is sick and they're in your uh, household and they have tested positive, then you too should stay inside and self-quarantine. Um, Put distance between yourself and others. Uh, this is especially important for high-risk individuals. So individuals with those risk factors uh, of having severe uh, illness if, if contracting COVID-19. So um, elderly, so your grandparents, um, even potentially your parents, depending on how old they are. Um, patients with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, Things like that. These are the um, are people that are very high risk of of contracting the the virus and also having very serious symptoms. So so again, social distancing is so important uh, to try to mitigate this this virus. And again, I know it's hard during this time. I have family uh, that lives far away in Florida, and we always try to see each other. But this year, we're we're taking it off and. Um, some of my colleagues have mentioned this. I even think there's a meme out there saying that, you know, as healthcare workers, we take off holidays almost every year. We have to work 24 seven. Um, and we're basically just asking you guys to take one off for us. Um, and hopefully we can get this behind us and we can celebrate next year with our families and friends. Next slide, please. So, uh, next up, which Dr. Motodell talked about as well, is wear a mask. Um, so, and again, I can't stress enough, you could spread COVID-19 to others, even if you don't feel sick. And I, to me, that's, that's the most dangerous uh, person, is the person that doesn't feel sick, that is positive. Because you do, you feel good. You want to go out and about, and you should go out and about. Um, as Dr. Motodell said as well, it's good for your mental health. We don't want you locked up in your house. Uh, for for a year, um, but when you go out and about, be safe. Um, wear a mask in public settings when you're around people um, that are, aren't living in your house. Um, you need to uh, the the mask is not meant to protect others. It's it's um, the the mask is meant to protect others. I'm sorry, it's not necessarily meant to. It does protect you, but it's it's meant to protect protect others in case you are infected. Um, as a healthcare worker, this is one that kind of hits home. You know, I, I go to the grocery store and I'll see people wearing N95 masks, and I wonder where the heck did you guys get those masks? Um, uh, you know, as we as we know, I'm sure you've heard on the news, a lot of health uh, hospitals have shortages of PPE and proper proper masks uh, and protective equipment. One of those things are, is the N95 mask. So try to limit yourself to masks. Um, again, the CDC has a great reference on there of um, what type of masks are, are good for the general public, um, how you can, uh, there's different things. There's like the gaiters, that's the, like 
almost like a turtleneck thing you pull up, but they, they talk about the layers of fabric and what's best uh, to protect yourself. Um, so I, I always urge people just go to the CDC. And again, this is basically the stuff that I'm telling you is coming from the CDC. These are all recommendations from the CDC. Um, and uh, again, keep six feet between yourself and others. And this is also very important. Just because you have a mask on doesn't, doesn't uh, substitute social distancing. So, you know, I've heard people say, that, well, you know, I had a whole bunch of people over it, but it was fine, we all wore a mask. That's not, that's not the point. Um, you, need to, you need to still social distance. Um, if you are uh, in a group of people, you should have a mask on and try to social distance as much as, as, much as you can. Um, always cover coughs and sneezes. So whether it's with a tissue, cover your nose and mouth, or we do the, the elbow technique, or I like to call it dabbing, the, do the dab. Um, and um, if, you, if you do use a tissue, throw it in the trash, don't throw it on the table for someone else to pick up and throw away for you or for it to spread around on the table. Um, and immediate wash your hands. So you sneeze, you cough, just go wash your hands. Wash them the 20 seconds, use hand sanitizer, whatever you have. Also, um, clean and disinfect surf surfaces, um, especially those frequently touched uh, surfaces. Try to do them daily. Uh, tables, doorknobs, light switches, phones, keyboards. Think of all the things that you touch uh, very frequently, especially at home. Um, you know, you touch a lot of things. The remote control of the TV. We're, we're all sitting at home, you know, a lot, a lot these days. So, and, and watching TV and Netflix. So, um, watch that uh, TV remote, video game controllers, things like that. Um, use detergent or soap and water before. So you can use a little soap and water to wipe down the table and then um, use a household disinfectant. And then again, CDC, if you go on their website, they will give you recommendations on what type of disinfectants to use uh, on household uh, um, surfaces. Next slide, please. This is, this is actually, um, I'm stealing this from a colleague of mine who was just interviewed um, for ABC Chicago. Um, my mentor, he's a respiratory therapist at Rush as well. And what he said in this interview was actually kind of struck a chord with me. And it was that, you know, we keep calling ourselves the front line, but it's really you guys, you guys are the front line. Um, we like, to, we actually are kind of the end of the line. You don't want to come into the hospital and be sick and, and see us. Um, but so, so if you guys do your part on the front line out there in the public, you can help mitigate this virus. We can flatten the curve again and, you know, put this behind us and go back to normal life. So, so it's really you guys that are the front line out there. Um, and again, when I'm not at work, I'm following all these guidelines. Uh, me and my fiance, my fiance is a ICU nurse uh, in the medical ICU. So we work together, we live together, we do everything together. And what we do is we go to work and we come home and that's pretty much it. If we go out to the store, we follow again, we're washing our hands, we're wearing a mask, we're staying socially distanced. Um, so it's been a tough year, but we all just need to hang in there, keep following these guidelines. and. Uh, when it comes to the activities at school and um, sports and things like that, you need to follow the guidelines that are given to you by the, the school or the sporting organization. Just follow the guidelines. Um, and again, hopefully we have more information coming soon about this stuff. You know, it, it seems like it's an ever evolving um, thing, but you know, we're in our, in almost a year. So we've learned a lot and we know what helps and, some of those simple things are, are those four W's that Dr. Motodel um, discussed. Uh, wear a mask, being, uh, I think it was walk six feet away, so social distancing, uh, wash your hands, and there's the fourth one that I can't remember, the fourth W. <laughs> um, wait at home. Wait at home, there you go, thank you. Wait at home. So wait at home if you're sick. So, um, or again, if someone in your house is sick. So. Following those simple guidelines, um, we can all get through this together. And that is all I have to say. 
Thank you so much, Tyler. I know you both must be exhausted working long hours during this year. You really are the heroes. I know you said that we're the front line, but you guys are the heroes this year and every year. Um, so at this time, everyone, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. Tyler and Dr. Monadel will stay on um, for a few minutes and answer those questions. We have plenty of time here. Um, and as you're typing in those questions, I want to draw your attention to other webinars we have coming up. You can go to this link on our website and also our foundation, which funds our scholarships. So please feel free to donate if you're so called to the foundation. Um, while we're waiting for some questions here, Tyler, I want to tell you that um, you said you healthcare workers sit out holidays every year and you're asking us to sit out this one. That really, that really hit me because it is really hard for us to stay home this year. Um, but that really puts it into perspective, doesn't it? I think that's a really, it's really well said, and I'll, I'll be stealing that and quoting you because it's, it's really well said. Well, I admit I stole it from. I, I, I can't remember where I saw it. I think it was a meme or something that uh, one of my nursing colleagues posted on social media, and I was like, that is for like. There's so many holidays that I've missed uh, just because it's. It's what we do. We miss Thanksgivings. We miss Christmases. We miss New Year's. We we miss them all the time. We, as again, the hospital doesn't shut down for the holidays. So, um, you know, in the, I've worked as a respiratory therapist for six years. I've probably missed half of the holidays. You know, every year. So, um, it's just one year. And we're asking you guys just sit this one out again. And now with the technology, I mean, we're meeting. We had some have someone out from India on here that we're communicating with right now, which is incredible. So technology, I think we can use it to our advantage. We can still meet with our grandparents virtually, um, cousins, aunts, uncles. You know, we can still celebrate. It's just a little different this year. Absolutely. Yeah. We have some good questions in the chat here. Um, Tina asks, will COVID become a seasonal illness like influenza? I think we're all wondering that. It's a great question. What do you guys think? That's a great question. And like so many things about COVID, we really don't know the answer at this point. Um, we don't, we haven't really been through a full year of it anywhere in the world. Um, and so I, I have a colleague I work with who's in emergency medical services and she always starts every time she gives any fact or data about COVID with the statement that what I'm about to say could change by the time I finish this sentence. And so, you know, tomorrow we might know more about that, but unfortunately we don't know if it will be. We don't know how long the immunity lasts and we don't know how long the immunity from a vaccine lasts. So at this point, we really don't know. Yeah, yeah, very, very good point. Um, Ileana asks, is it okay to have the mask down when you're outside? Contentious point. It is, yeah. Uh, you know, if you're out in a park and there is no one around you, <laughs> um, I think, yes, it's okay. We're actually finding here in Chicago a little benefit of the mask. Um, we're not used to wearing masks all the time, but now we are. It's kind of nice because it's cold. <laughs> so having this mask, it's a little extra, extra uh, warmth on the face. But um, yeah, I, I think as long as you are socially distanced from people. I mean, if I'm thinking about the parks here in Chicago, very big parks. I may be in a park, there might be someone 100 yards away from me. Sure, you know, if that's, if that's the case, you know, you don't necessarily need a mask on. But if you're, there's people in close quarters and you're out and about, then um, yes, have a mask on. Yeah, and I'll just follow that up, basically echoing exactly what you said, Tyler, that, you know, if you are safely distanced from other people that are not in your household, then I think that is fine. Um, but I will also say that the CDC came out this week saying, you know, they really would recommend as long as you're not at home that you wear a mask. So unless there's a great reason for you to take it off, and it sounds like there's maybe even some good ones to leave it on in colder climates, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would encourage you to leave the mask on. But if you are safely distanced, then yes, it is safe to do that. Back on the indoor outdoor question, Sherry is asking how, how safe is indoor sports practice? I assume you would say with a mask on, it's probably more safe than without. 
Certainly with a mask on, it's more safe. You know, we definitely encourage any sports that can be done outside, even if they're not usually done outside, to be performed outside. And that's primarily for the ventilation factor. So a lot of the answer to that question as to how safe it is depends on what sort of ventilation um, is in that building. So can doors be open wide? Are there windows there? Um, can you safely distance as well in an indoor space? When you're exercising, you are exerting enough um, uh, force in your lungs that you're actually really needing more like 10 to 12 feet distance from other people. Um, so again, when I say make sure you, there's room to distance, I mean even beyond six feet. And so I, you know, just always encourage to get outside more. Um, and again, it will depend on your county and your state because if there's not a high prevalence of COVID, then that answer might change. It might be safer um, to do indoor sports in those areas. But in many places right now, the prevalence is high enough that we wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Here's a, a question that I know has been in the news a lot um, from Samuel. Do you have reservations or concerns about the COVID vaccine? What are your words for people who do? I can, I can start with that. So um, I actually, uh, in San Diego, we actually have a lot of opportunities to participate in vaccine trials. And so I did sign up uh, to be in the vaccine trials. I only recently was contacted because there were actually apparently lots of volunteers. So I'm in the process of signing up for one of the other vaccines, not one you've heard about in the news yet, because we'll need multiple versions of this vaccine in order to vaccinate everyone. What I've seen from the data um, is very reassuring. I've actually not seen a vaccine in a long time that has shown the um, efficacy of, of these vaccines being 95% effective is amazing, is not what we were expecting. Um, and side effects have been minimal and consistent with getting a vaccine. So, you know, when, when I do get it, and I will get a vaccine once I'm in that category of people eligible for it. Um, you know, the first vaccine you get, you may experience some side effects, and the second one you may experience more or less. Um, but those are typically, you know, a sore arm, having some sore muscles, fever. Um, and so oftentimes when people get the flu shot, they'll say, oh, I got the flu afterwards. And it's really, this is a side effect of the vaccine. It's not an infection. Just like with the COVID vaccine, it's not that they've gotten infected with COVID. It's that you're having that reaction that we want you to have. Your immune system is responding to the vaccine, is revving up. And that's what makes you feel a little bit lousy. But from what I've seen, um, those symptoms post-COVID vaccine are usually lasting less than 24 to 48 hours. And people are certainly not nearly as sick as you would be if you actually got infected. Yeah, for sure. And I will um, direct a question to Tyler. And at the same time, um, Dr. Motadel, there's a question in the chat here from uh, Dave and Pam Stanley with some really detailed questions about a particular case. If you want to respond to them directly in the chat, I think that would be appreciated. Okay, I'll uh, take a look. If you, if you see that there. Um, but Tyler, you mentioned there's still a shortage of PPE for healthcare workers. Uh, That's the question we have here in the chat. There, uh, you know, at my hospital, we're okay, but I will say we're still reusing some things. Uh, we're being cautious. Um, so, you know, the N95 mask in particular, I wore one, the same one all day today. Um, again, it's just to, not that's because we don't have, um, have more to use, um, but it's, it's just to make sure we don't run out. Uh, we have seen this past week and we kind of expected this to happen as we, um, we have seen quite an uptick in our COVID patients. We expect to get worse next week as well because um, you know, it's two weeks after Thanksgiving and people gathered. Um, so now they're, they're, they're coming into the hospital sick. So because we don't really know where this is gonna go, especially with the holidays, you know, we want to just make sure we don't we aren't using, before the pandemic, I used, if I had a patient where I needed to wear an N95 mask, um, like a, tuber, a tuberculosis patient or something like that, I would wear my N95 mask in that room, I would take it off when I'm done, and every single time I go in the room, I'd grab a new N95 mask. Um, but now when we have every single patient in the ICU or the unit in which I need to wear an N95 mask, between all the clinicians that have to go see that patient, that's a lot of N95 masks to take off and put back on. So we are just trying to um, mitigate the shortage. So we are reusing PPE. So again, it kind of, when we're out at the grocery store, me and my fans are like, look, they have that, like that's a good N95 mask. So where did they get that one from, you know? 
Um, you gotta just grab it, take yeah, it. Like, yeah, like, yeah, like, man, it's a good one. So, yeah, there, and, you know, and I come from a very big, um, big hospital in Chicago, so smaller community hospitals, I'm sure, uh, maybe seeing even more shortage, uh, shortages, so, um, or, or lower, lower funded hospitals and clinics and things like that, so, um, yeah, there's still an issue. Wow. I, I didn't, I honestly didn't realize it was still an issue either. I guess when the news stops covering it, we all forget about it, but yeah. that puts it into perspective. It really does. Thinking about how many people have to use those masks. It's definitely important that we use alternative masks. Yeah. yeah. Um, and here's another question. And I appreciate Dr. Motodell, you responding in the chat there. I, I know that's a, that's a good question. Um, Tyler, you might be able to answer this since you're an adult. Um, therapist there. Um, Tina's asking, I've heard about previous COVID patients who had recovered but experienced something called acute post-COVID symptoms, but most of them are in adulthood or early 20s. Do children and adolescents also experience this? I have no idea. I, I, can, I, I, can, yeah. I can address I that. Yeah. yeah, I would say I, I literally have like Neopeds, pediatric neonates are like my, I have no idea about them. <laughs> all adults. <laughs> no problem. So actually it's, it's ironic that you ask because I have a colleague who actually is experiencing that right now. So I've been uh, reading up on it a little bit as of late. Um, there are basically what we call case reports of this sort of re-emergence of symptoms somewhere between two to three weeks after the symptoms first were presented. Um, and it's not really well known whether they're contagious again at that point or not, but they're generally asked to, re to re-isolate um, again and, and to rest and usually for longer periods of time at that point. As, as the um, person asking the question indicated, we haven't really seen, we've seen this in adults and young adults. Um, there hasn't been a lot of case reports from what I've seen of younger people, but we similarly do see something two to three weeks after initial symptoms, and that's the multi-inflammatory syndrome that I discussed that we see in children. Now, there have been some case reports of that in adults as well, but that one is really affecting that 10 to 20-year-old group. So it's not as common in the littler kids, but in the older teens and the teens and the older teens and even into young adulthood, we have been seeing that. And that presents a little bit differently because it can really be any organ system. So you might present with chest pain. You know, we particularly worry about that cardiac disease from it. Um, but sometimes it's just body aches. Sometimes it's swelling. Sometimes it's headaches. So if any symptoms are kind of developing and you've known you've had COVID or you're feeling particularly sick, these kids are usually very sick and need to be hospitalized. We certainly want Want you to seek medical attention. Wow, yeah, it's truly a deadly disease. If it can be that severe for children, that's frightening. But yeah, um, this one, this question is is really odd because I've been feeling the exact same way, so I really relate to it. I think it's a big issue um, balancing the the detrimental effects of isolation while balancing being safe. So we have a, a attendee in the chat who says, for so long, staying indoors and being at home has been my comfort place and a way for me to take care of my mental health. With quarantine, home sometimes doesn't feel like a place for me to regroup and relax since it has also turned into my workplace and I have to stay indoors. How do I deal with this and find new ways to take care of myself? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, echoing what many people are feeling, whether you are extroverted or introverted to begin with. I think we're all a little tired of, of being at home, and it's not a place of comfort as much as feeling kind of um, enclosed at this point. So I, you know, I would encourage you to try and get outdoors, even if it's just to go for a walk around the block, um, you know, once a day or a couple times a week, just something that gets you kind of out of your house and gives you a fresh perspective. Um, Tyler was mentioning before, you know, about getting out to a park. We really would encourage those outdoor spaces to be utilized safely, um, but is, is a great way to do it. There's also, um, you know, a lot of right now, there's free apps and free websites to do some uh, self meditation, to do meditation and other self relaxation techniques so that you can sort of feel a sense of calm, even if you are stuck inside. Um, journaling is strongly encouraged. Gratitude journals are really popular right now because just thinking about those things that are you're grateful for and that you're positive for can help turn your mindset um, into being a little bit happier than you might otherwise be. So it is a balance. Um, and I did previously put some um, a website that might also offer some more tips in the chat, um, which is the howrightnow.org website that the CDC is, uh, has an initiative with to help with these coping skills. Yeah. 
uh, mental health is just, I, I didn't, it, for me, I guess I didn't expect it to be such a big issue with the pandemic. And then we were all at home and we realized how bad isolation can be for us as social beings. So it's very important. I find that taking a walk around the block at least helps a little bit um, better than nothing. Um, and then another question we have in here, um, which is pretty interesting, and I've thought about this as well, are there um, minerals or vitamins or anything diet-wise that we can do um, to rev up our immune response? I know we all know vitamin C, but is there anything in particular we can do that's actually going to give us a boost if we do get COVID? So once you're infected, there's not any data that I'm aware of at this point that really supports one vitamin, mineral, or, or diet that would be supportive. As Grace mentioned, you know, pre-getting sick, there is some data around the common cold related to vitamin C being effective. If you're taking that on a regular basis, can help prevent um, the common cold or reduce your symptoms when you have it. Um, outside of that, there's not strong literature that's, that's supported for anything in particular that I'm familiar with. Tyler, I don't know about you. Same, same. The, some doc, doctors may give you, um, you know, tell you to, you know, take vitamin C, um, so, uh, zinc, melatonin, things like that. And that's kind of like their little vitamin pack. But there's no, um, again, no like strong evidence to say that this is, um, you know, beneficial to get you better. It's just kind of to, as we do, you know, when I have a little, feel a little cold or something, I take my my zinc and my uh, my vitamin C just to try to help you know boost anything. So it's I don't think it's going to harm you to take it. But there again, there's no um, there's no strong evidence stating that it's it's going to help cure you or anything. I think I think a big important thing too um, is that I think there's a misunderstanding a little bit that if you were infected with COVID nineteen, that now you're all of a sudden immune to getting COVID nineteen again. Um, and, and again, this kind of goes back to the vaccine. Is it going to be a regular thing that we get? We don't know because we don't know how long the antibodies are going to last. Same thing. When you're infected, your body does build up antibodies to the virus. Um, however, we've found that they don't necessarily stay around all that long. I've had several patients come back infected a second time. Um, so, so, you know, I have some people, even in my family that were, uh, infected and then they're like well i'm so glad i got it because I'm, I'm done with it i don't you know it was mild and now i don't need to worry about it anymore i'm like no that's not the case you you can absolutely get it again so you still need to stay um f follow all the precautions and be safe so i just want to make sure that was out there uh, because there are a lot of people that think that i got it i got the antibodies i'm set i'm good to go right like chicken pox or, right, or something yeah. like that yeah just don't know that yet. exactly yeah. Yeah, very important point. This is a new disease, the novel coronavirus. I remember I kept telling people the novel, um, yeah. when people were getting frustrated about, oh, the guidance is changing day by day. It's like, it's a new disease. We know nothing about it. It's definitely important to be flexible and have your open mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's a kind of, a, I, I don't know if this is a fun question, but um, Ankit asks, how many times would you have to wash your hands in a day while going outside? And what's the minimum distance we have to make with others to protect ourselves? So I think the minimum distance is definitely six feet. Um, I don't know if you can put a number on how many times you need to wash your hands, right? Oh, man, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> Depends on what you've been doing, yeah. really. So, you know, Tyler said in his talk, like if you've coughed or sneezed, wash your hands, wash your hands before and after you eat, wash your hands when you're touching things out in public. So lots of different reasons to wash your hands, but no set number. Yeah. Except for the 20 seconds when you do wash it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a particular song you sing when you're washing your hands? I know there are multiple different songs going around, like Happy Birthday and... Yeah, Happy Birthday ABCs are like the common ones, you know. Yeah. There, I actually sometime earlier in the pandemic had Googled for my staff other songs. So I don't have that list on me, but you can Google it. And there's actually lots of fun pop songs and current songs that might be more enjoyable for you to sing if you sing the, the verse, the chorus to it um, yeah. once or twice also fits the bill. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. The dry hands are, are bad in the winter anyway. So got to keep that lotion on the hands as well. <laughs> Um, Mandy is asking, um, oh, hi, Mandy. That's Mandy from Health Professions Week. Happy to have you join us, Mandy. Um, when do you think a COVID vaccine will be ready for kids? 
So that's a fabulous question, and it's another one that I don't know for sure. Um, we do know that um, Pfizer has started their testing in 12 to 17 year olds, so that's great news. Um, they're enrolling uh, teenagers right now in the uh, phase three trials, so that's fabulous. And Moderna is on the verge of doing the same. Um, when they'll go down to a younger age, nobody has announced at this point, but until they do, um, obviously the, the vaccine won't be recommended for children. As far as allocation of vaccine, if there has been sufficient clinical trials with data, um, safe data showing, data showing it's safe and um, effective in children, uh, children are considered to be in phase three of the allocation. Uh, so there's four phases. The first phase is, as you might expect, healthcare workers and those living in nursing homes, and then um, later those that are with co um, comorbid conditions or high-risk conditions. Phase two tends to be your essential workers. Um, and then phase three is young adults and children are in that phase three. However, that phase, depending on the volume of vaccines available, might come upon us before it's actually safe to give it to kids. So, you know, we hope before next, the start of next school year, that's a, that's a goal, I know, of, of the industry. Um, whether we'll actually hit that goal in time or not remains to be seen. Yeah. Interesting. Another, um, Pediatric question for you here, Dr. Mededel. Um, do you have any recommendations on how to handle COVID happening at the same time as normal childhood illness? I work in a pre-K to eighth grade and find it challenging as to when to send kids home versus letting them stay for a normal cough or runny nose. Yeah, so you know what we're telling our, our uh, teachers, I'm on a weekly call with the, with the teachers in the county and this question comes up all the time, you know, do we really have to exclude the kid with the runny nose? It's winter, they all have a runny nose, um, you know, and we just keep telling them we don't know which of these symptoms is going to be from COVID. And so we have that CDC list of symptoms and if they have just one of those symptoms, it may not be COVID, but Really, I think you know we need to start rethinking whether any sick kid, whether it be COVID or not, is in the schools, right? Or anybody goes to work with that common cold anymore. I think we're gonna see some change in that philosophy of, oh, it's just a cold, I'm gonna to go to work anyways. Um, so, you know, I think at this point, even if it's with another infection or you're not sure, it's err on the side of assuming it's COVID. So we actually in San Diego require that um, anybody with one symptom is excluded from school um, until they've had a negative test and 72 hours symptom free. If they don't get tested, then they have to be assumed to have COVID and they're out for 10 days. And I know the daycares in particular have a really hard time with this with the toddlers and as I mentioned, their runny nose, but it's really in an effort to keep everyone safe. Yeah, for sure. So we're almost near the end of our time here. So I want to offer you both one more chance to give us some words of encouragement. As Tyler said, it's time for us all to buckle down. What can you say to us tonight, especially our high school members who are having so much trouble with online learning versus in-person learning? What can you tell us? Oh, that's kind of hard. I mean, I've kind of, I feel like I kind of tried to rally the troops a little bit in my talk um, with the buckling down. Um, you know, in terms of the school, I mean, I, I can't imagine, um, you know, the challenges that, you know, online learning and things like that have, have, um, have, have came with, with this pandemic. So again, I think, I think it's the, the mental, mental health, I think is the most, one of the most important things. And Dr. Modadel's slide showed how, how much it, um, this pandemic has impacted mental health. So still, you know, try to, try to stay positive, follow your, follow the guidelines. Again, just follow the guidelines and this can be done and over with, um, and still try to have fun and, you know, um, still be social with friends, but in a safe way. Again, technology, use technology to your advantage. Um, but I, th I think it just comes down to just stay safe and hopefully this thing will be behind us and then we can all go back to normal. Exactly. So I would just say, you know, oftentimes people are looking to know what they can do that's safe. And I think the better way to think about it is what, what things can I do that have the lower risk? Because everything is going to have a risk. And so we really need to think in terms of risk, what we call risk mitigation or reduction in risk. And the way, um, I wish I had the graphic available to show you, but the way to sort of think about it is um, slices of Swiss cheese. So, you know, the face mask, that's, that slice of Swiss cheese has a few holes in it. And so maybe some things get through, but you put another 
another slice of Swiss cheese there and it has different holes. And so maybe some of those holes don't overlap because you're now six feet apart. And then you have another slice of Swiss cheese that covers up those remaining holes um, because you've um, waited at home when you're sick or wash your hands. So all of these things are to reduce risk. And so really you have to weigh that risk and parents have to weigh that risk for their, for their adolescents as well to decide what things are too risky for your certain circumstances. And you know, as, in, as an example, um, I live with my 87 year old uh, father-in-law who has heart conditions and lung conditions and my kid's school is open. They're doing a fabulous job um, of doing in-person learning, but we chose to keep our kids home because for us that risk was too high. Um, and I was sharing with Grace before the meeting here that you know my, I have a nanny who has some symptoms and for us the risk was it was too much of a risk to have her come without being tested first. So she's um, home quarantining right now until we can get her tested because for us, the risk of me being interrupted during this uh, venue was, was more important than me risking my father-in-law's health. So everything is really a risk, bal balancing that risk for your personal circumstances. Um, and so there are things that you can do more safely than others. And I would encourage you that if you're feeling that you need to do something different than what you're doing now, because your mental health is suffering, then do that and do it the safest way possible um, within your public health order guidelines. So I think there's still lots of opportunities to get out and be social, um, keeping your distance, being outside, um, and then and we've talked a lot about technology. I know I miss hugs as much as anyone, um, but it's, you know we're going to get there. It's going to be a little bit longer, but we're going to get there again. Yeah, I, I could not have come up with a better metaphor to end on, Dr. Motodell, than the Swiss cheese. Yeah. The cheese COVID metaphor, that's that's perfect to end on. And I haven't had dinner, so now I'm hungry. But I <laughs> wanna thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna steal so many things you said tonight to encourage my community. Um, but thank you for the work you're doing, for the work you've done this crazy year. I know we all appreciate it. Um, everyone who is tuning in still, please stay safe. Here at NSHSS, we hope to see you in in-person events next year. We are desperate to see you in person just as much as you are. So we will hopefully see you in 2021 in person. However, we will continue doing virtual events as long as it's necessary. Um, but please join us for those. However, have a good night in the meantime and stay safe. And thank you again, Dr. Motadel and Tyler. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.